but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. I'm James. This is episode 177. We're here to talk about the next-gen ATP Finals, Fed Cup. Uh, we're going to do a book report. We are... What else are we doing this episode? Wow, you're just right down to business. Right down to business. No no messing around. This was the first uh, day of snow in Toronto. It was terrible. Terrible. Mm -hmm. And it's still going. It's only November 11th and we're having to deal with this. And I am, I'm in disbelief and I'm just choosing not to engage with it because the prospects of what this means for the length of our winter or the severity of it, it's, it's too much to wrap my head around right now. Back to the matter at mm -hmm. hand, we also have some new Margaret Court stuff to deal with. And you are gifted with a new PED suspension. It's your favorite thing to deal with. What? I just find it uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I live for the stories. Yeah, you're trying to find a way to, to spin this so that you don't look like a complete asshole. Right. But right. the level of enthusiasm that this stuff generates for you, I mean, it's it's unparalleled. It's like nerd enthusiasm, though. Hmm. You recently wrote on Twitter that you had an extremely embarrassing moment about 15 years ago when you mispronounced the word hors d'oeuvre. Wow. And I want I wow. want to see if you would be willing to share your interpretation of the word at the time. Wow, at least I know now that you are not my ride or die because <laughs> I was gonna do this to myself at the end. You'll really? see at the on the agenda I have it written at the bottom. Oh, so we'll we'll wait. Uh, everyone will be on pins and needles waiting for your pronunciation of hors d'oeuvre. Wow. I really can't believe you did that. <laughs> Let's talk about the ATP Next Gen Finals. This event started as this very innovative turn tennis on its head event. The first year it had that distasteful uh, draw ceremony with the models and it was rather uncomfortable. The event has evolved and I think it's trying things for better or for worse, which we'll talk about in a bit. But the champions and the finalists of the ATP Next Gen Finals have been actually very revelatory. We started with Chung, who reached the Australian Open semifinals a few months later. Tsitsipas won last year. Demon Hour is a two-time runner-up. Well, Tsitsipas also went on to make the Australian Open semifinals the following year as well. Oh yes, good point. So this, for Yannick Sinner, the winner this year, he could be a dark horse favorite if you believe in those things come Australia. Yeah. A lot of people are touting him as a future number one, a future winner of multiple slams. Of course, we don't play that game in this house, but... We have played that game before. Well, not really anymore. But we are here to talk about Yannick's week. Uh, Demon Hour went in as the heavy favorite to win this title after Shapovalov, Tsitsipas, and Oje Aliasim pulled out. Sinner was originally the local wild card. And he, I think, was 11th in the race to Milan, but eventually just qualified outright because of the withdrawals. I will remind you, James, and the listeners, that I said on our previous episode that you should not be surprised if Sinner won the whole thing. He you was said that? I did. I said that. Go back. Check the tape. I have nothing else to add on that front. <laughs> Opening round, Francis TFO lost to Sinner, and it looked disappointing on its face. Although you, uh, you know, were very prescient about Sinner's chances here. As the tournament went on, it looked less like a bad loss. Sinner beat Emir, he lost to Umber in the round robin, beats Kachmanovic in the semis, and then we know what happened with Demon Hour in the final. Just uh, basically a demolition. These wins, in, in effect, for me, mean nothing. Yes, Sinner had a great week, but I still don't care. Mm. Because the scoring is so absurd that... You can't really translate or extrapolate that to proper match conditions. Right. It's first of four games. If you get to three all, you play a tie break. There's, there's no add. So the, you're not simulating 
the match conditions that these guys are playing week to week, year in, year out. Like, this is not tennis as we know it. So good for him for winning. But as much as we say, well, look for him next year. He's, he played out of his mind. He played well. I'd be hard-pressed to say that he would necessarily beat Tiafo or Diminar in best of three sets or best of five sets at the Australian Open. It's, right. it's a totally different ball game. We have to be careful to not get ahead of ourselves and situate these results for what they are. When these opponents have had years of playing the big points, right? Like the decisive points, which don't really exist in the same way in this format. So getting to six all, getting to five, six in a set, the guys who have been out here for three or four years on the main tour may have a little more experience in converting those those games and those points. But Sinner looked amazing. His serve was obviously effective on the surface, kind of medium fast, I would say. I wouldn't say it was like a lightning fast indoor court. Those are few and far between these days. There weren't a ton of aces in his match, but there were a lot of unreturnable serves, and he was very consistent converting first and second serve points. I think that was the difference. His second serve, in the final he won 63%. In other matches it was even higher than that. That is very difficult to overcome. He won two of the three matches in his round robin, won the semifinal, won the final, payday almost $500,000, Diminar making almost $300,000. The cool thing about this tournament for me is that it gives young young guys the opportunity to, to bank a lot of money that can set them up for the following year. Right. That $500,000 will go a long way to establishing Sinner on the ATP Tour. It'll open up a lot more resources for him. He'll be able to travel with a bigger team, surround himself with more experienced people. And that is the real boon for me for this event for young players. Having somebody like Shapovalov come in and win if he did this year, what does it really mean for him going forward? It's more of a novelty thing for him. Right. As opposed to a career building event for some of these other players. Tell us a little bit about Yannick Sinner. Right. Tennis insiders and super fans have been touting this guy for a long time, but he's relatively new to the main tour. He's 18. He's from the South Tyrol region of Italy, which is a German-speaking region. I saw a lot of people asking, like, why is he ginger and why does he speak German? <laughs> and this is a region of Italy that only became annexed into the country in 1918, after World War One. And there's another tennis player about whom folks have been asking those similar questions. Right. Why does Andreas have a German first name, for example? He's, Andreas Seppi is a native German speaker. This, uh, this region was actually part of Austria-Hungary up until the end of World War I. Interesting fact was that Italy said they wouldn't join the fighting in World War I if they were, unless they were guaranteed to get South Tyrol. So it was annexed shortly after the war. Uh, Yannick has trained with Riccardo Piatti since he was 13. He was actually a very competitive skier and placed second in Italy. So when he was 13 years old, he had to decide between the two sports. Riccardo Piatti, you know, or you may know, coached Ivan Lubicic for 15 years. I didn't realize their relationship was so long, but he has parlayed that success into coaching Djokovic in the mid-2000s, Gasquet, Raonic, Ornachoric. They split up in September, and he's been working with Maria Sharapova recently. We speculated that Chorich's split with Piatti had to do with the fact that he was splitting his time and uh, attention with Sharapova at the end of the season. Who knows? Oh, Piatti L is a very busy man, clearly. Little did we know that he was also working with Sinner. I mean, all these top coaches, they're working with a bunch of other people. We see Morata Glue working with a host of players outside of just Serena Williams. For them, their coaching is their brand. Sure. And we don't know how much actual one-on-one -on -one time Piatti is giving to all these players. He has an academy in Liguria, and there are players coming in and out of there all the time. Sinner's rise has been rapid, to say the least. He started the year outside of the top 500 at 553. This was the first year he was playing main draw events on the ATP level. In February and March, he put together a 16-match win streak, winning the Bergamo Challenger, and two ITFs in a row. He won another challenger in Lexington, Kentucky in August, qualified for the U.S. Open, took a set off Stan Wawrinka. 
that was his first main draw in a Grand Slam. So he is here. We will see what he does in 2020. Congrats to him. Anything else you want to say about the Next Gen Finals? Well, I, I referenced the innovation. That's a big part of their brand. Next Gen is always trying to experiment and debut new... Facets of the game? Tweak yeah, the they, game? they sort of throw things at the wall and see what sticks. When they came around, they debuted this electronic line calling, which was a new technology at the time. The scoring, as you said, no ads, four games in a set, a tie break at three all. The We know about the headset coaching after each set. Nobody smashed their headset this year, like Stefano Tsitsipas did last year. We did get a few F-bombs from Francis Tiafo. Uh, yeah, which will happen with Francis and Nick. Why are you bringing Nick into this? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, no, Zach, not Nick, Francis's coach. Oh. No, Zach. See, I thought you were talking about Kyrios. No, sorry, not Nick, Zach even did, Francis's coach, who is there to sort of ride the wave of Francis and move past it. They had some very funny interactions. What does that mean? Ride the wave of Francis? Well, Frank gets his F-bombs out, gets a little frustration out, and then Zach says, okay, so now that that's out of the way, can we move on? <laughs> is calling him Frank a thing? No, I call him. I just, I just okay. want to call him Frank. There's the shorter warm-up. They want to get players on the court warming up and starting within five minutes. So back to the electronic line calling. There was a thing, right? There's no challenge system at this event because all the lines are called electronically. There's still a chair umpire, of course, and there's still people looking at the foot faults on video. But there's not the whole cadre of line umpires because supposedly they're not needed. This experiment did backfire a little bit in a match between Kecmanovic and Davidovich Fokina. Orly Tort was in the chair, and this weird thing happened. And thanks to Victoria Chiesa for pointing this out and pointing us in the direction of a video. So Kecmanovic serves, it's returned, and there's no call. But on the video replay, clearly the ball bounced and then hit his racket. And it bounced out. But since there was no call, the point would have normally proceeded as if it were a winner. That he accidentally hit it with his racket before it bounced. We can see very clearly on the video, and the umpire is viewing it, and she's annoyed because it was clearly just a mistake uh, of the system so she's trying to explain it to the players everybody's mad she turns around looks at the tournament referee and she says can i overrule the system and this guy's like i don't know i mean <laughs> he was no help at all did you see the video i did not nor do i think that your explanation is particularly clear <laughs> i'm just let i'm just not that interested in this whole thing like, there, there's this balance between taking the event seriously, but then the tournament itself undercutting that with it, with all its gimmicks. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And so when something like this happens, the emotions are high, players are playing for money, they're making themselves vulnerable by opening themselves up to high-profile wins and losses, sure. But, like, I, I just have a hard time getting worked up about something like this, you know? Sure. It just seems in that specific instance, they would have had a, a protocol for this. Like the umpire should be empowered to say, you know what, the system screwed up, I'm overruling, I don't care. I don't even have to ask anybody. But she was clearly in white. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with yeah. that, because as the umpire, you're going to get the flack for all those oh, things. Oh, yeah, because the players don't know what's going on, and they're going to argue their side. I think my larger question here is, are these innovations a good thing like overall do they get points for trying things and i think this is more of a, a rhetorical question because i think the jury's still out i think some are interesting and some have to be trashed this is like a, a workshopping stage i say let them do whatever the hell they want as long as there's no overriding push to metastasize this throughout tennis we're at a phase in the season where it's it's tedious to keep watching tennis Right. Not just to find the tennis, but to have the interest in watching tennis because the season is so long. We are less than two months away from the start of the 2020 season in earnest. Like probably not even a month and a half. Like it starts up right after Christmas, yeah. right? Mm. And so I get it why a tournament like this would tinker with stuff to, to have a novelty aspect to get people to watch. 
And I don't think that the the tournament or the organizers or the ATP think that this is something that that is going to be earth shattering, right? In terms of revolutionizing tennis, I think they they understand their place in the calendar, and that they can't replicate the ATP Tour Finals. They can't have it make it seem too similar because then you're just diluting your own product and it's boring. Exactly. Right. But some of these changes do get implemented on the main tour. The shot clock is the biggest example. Okay. I'm just saying, we have an ATP CEO now who's coming in 2020 who has said in the past that he's in favor of playing with the format of the game, shortened formats. So I think there maybe is something to it this time. Four game sets will never happen. It absolutely will okay, never good. happen. All right, let's move on to Fed Cup. France wins its third Fed Cup. Australia gets so close. Ash Barty finishes world number one, but said what she really, really wanted this year was Fed Cup. With Fed Cup and what we've seen with Davis Cup in the past, and what makes it so meaningful to a lot of the players, is how much planning they have to do to make it a part of their schedule. And for players like Barty and Stozer and the Garcias and the Mladenoviches, they, they at the start of the year have penciled in Fed Cup above so many other tournaments. And it's meaningful to them. And so it was an exceptional cap to the women's season to have these two teams play this tie and have it turn out so well. It was very evenly matched. It was a difficult tie to call before. Kiki Mladenovic is a stalwart for France. Carolyn Garcia, we know how talented and capable she is, but she's been in a bit of a slump over the past year or so. Then we have Barty and Stozer, two Grand Slam winning doubles players. Barty, the world number one. There was a lot of intrigue going into it. What surprised me is that France has only won three Fed Cups, and they've all been in the last 22 years. Well, that's because the Czech team has been winning everything. Right. And Australia has won seven, which is not surprising, but they have not won a single Fed Cup since 1974. They have been the runner-up nine times since 1974 and haven't won one. And the last time that they were in a final was in the early 90s, with Rene Stubbs playing that tie. Oh, wow. Kiki Mladenovic basically owned this tie. She showed out. It was It was crazy. And it reminds you what she is actually capable of as a player. The tie started with Mladenovic beating Tomljanovic 6-1, 6-1. And then there was a an even more brutal scoreline in the second rubber with Barty beating Garcia 6-love, six 6-love. Six yes, a, a much more accomplished player, to be fair. Garcia just was not there. Well, I mean, you mentioned that Garcia has been struggling. I, I wouldn't say that she wasn't there. Barty played unreal tennis frankly the right. serving the aces there were so many times that garcia had her on the run not to say that garcia could have come back and won this match but it could easily have been a 6-3 6-3 scoreline but barty was having none of it so many times garcia had her running into the corners on both wings and ash came up with the goods every time most surprising for me was how many times barty passed garcia at the net off the backhand wing with a two-handed backhand. Mm. That was wild. And you got the full range of Barty's game in that match. And poor Garcia, really. It came at, at a horrible time in her year and career to suffer this kind of loss. But when you consider that Barty just won Shenzhen, she's the year in world number one, she's won a slam this year, there's nobody riding higher in women's tennis than her right now and so their opposing directions in terms of where they're going in their careers collided in this match in the third rubber we get mladenovic and barty and that was a great match ash wins the first set 6-2 over kiki it's a much more competitive match than the garcia one kiki comes back in the second winning 6-4 and there is just a massive highlight reel. These rallies were awesome. They were full of variety. I mean, both players can dictate on the forehand, but the versatility coming off Kiki's forehand was very cool to see. Inside out, down the line, cross court. She just... Slicing on the run to stay in points. Right? 
You know she just won Shenzhen in doubles with Babosh. Her skills at the net and drop shots are on full display in this match. It was just such an exciting contest between these two players who have so much variety and creativity on the court. On paper, you'd expect Barty to win this easily. And when she goes up 3-love in the first set, at that point she had won 15 straight games <laughs> in singles in this Fed Cup tie. 15 straight games. She looked impregnable. Even when she was tested, she found a way. And so for Mladenovic to find a way back into this match and not have that Barty train run away with her is... It's, it's, it's something. And it's amazing how she can get her mind right at Fed Cup. But it's can be a mess elsewhere she's had better results this year she hasn't had a terrible year i believe she's back inside the top 40 it's possible that had her and sasha continued that that progress would have increased even further or more rapidly in the new year who knows I, this is not the same kiki that we remember from 2018 is my point. oh god long long losing streak this is not the same kiki clearly and i hope it's a bellwether of what's to come because when she is playing well, her game is very exciting to watch. I know not everyone likes it, or her, <laughs> and I get that, but you have got to respect the performance she put in at this Fed Cup final. I think you just read yourself, because I think you were... Probably, yeah. <laughs> and maybe I'll save this recording for when you want to trash talk her again in the future. <laughs> in the fourth rubber, Tom Lanovic defeats Parmentier, gets to sort of put some respect on her own name, after losing badly to Kiki in the first rubber. And finally, in the fifth rubber, it's 2-all. The deciding match is the matchup we deserve, but that we want and deserve. Stozer and Barty versus Garcia Mladenovic in doubles. Just the, the level of doubles aptitude and talent on that court is superior. It was surprising in that match that Ash Barty wasn't able to dominate on her serve more, mm. like we've seen in the past. Perhaps what we also saw was a lack of, of seasoning of Barty and Stozer together as a pair. Whereas Mladenovic and Garcia have a long history of playing together, playing on the tour together, winning slams together, right? Before they split, they won, we just looked it up, the 2016 Roland Garros. They were also in the US Open final that year, did big things at the top of the rankings together. I believe they made it to number one. Like They, they have a history together and they also played Fed Cup together. So while there was all that drama and the fallout and the, the spotlight on, wow, will they will they ever play together again? What it will be like when they play together again? That's not something... It's like riding a bicycle, almost. And they've also gone on to be successful separately. Like, these are two of the best doubles players in the world, period, point blank. Yes. After that 2016 Fed Cup, Kiki and Caroline played the deciding rubber and lost to Czech Republic. Which is no great shame, of course, because Czech has been so dominant in this competition. But Caroline took time off of Fed Cup, was harshly criticized by Kiki and Alizé. There was some mean girling going on. But they are back together and they are gelling as a doubles team. And they're even hugging each other on the court. They're being professionals well. about it. Being professionals about it. Let's not say it's more than it is. <laughs> Who knows? They're at the very least being professional no, about it. No, I don't know their life. And their professionalism as doubles players together is immense yes so while if you take ash and sam individually as doubles players because we know ash's storied career with casey delacqua we know that sam stozer has had a great year in doubles she played in shenzhen that you'd think that together they would be the better team this year when you combine both players but that wasn't the case sam stozer has insisted that she is not retiring after this year, she'll be back, and Australia as a team could very well be back in the final. Moving on, another coaching split. This one was surprising to me. Karolina Pliskova and Conchita Martinez have parted ways. Karolina had a successful year finishing number two, winning, I think, four titles. Underperformed probably at the slams, but I would say the, the coaching relationship did what it was supposed to do. And like I said on the previous podcast, it makes sense to me that these coaching relationships do not last. And so I'm no longer surprised. Keep in mind, we went through Bayern and Osaka splitting shortly after winning the Australian Open and the US Open in back-to-back -back slams. Like, there, nothing about coaching splits should surprise anybody anymore. 
and there are any number of reasons why folks can decide to split up, don't underestimate to the the toll that it takes on the coaches. Yes. For somebody like Conchita, who's toured and traveled her entire life, maybe she wants to slow down a little bit, catch her breath for a little while. Maybe Carolina would want more of her as far as her travel schedule than she's willing to give. Who knows? Maybe they had a, a fist fight at, re- at a dinner one night. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Any number of things could happen. But what I do think, and what I, th- what I think a lot of folks are thinking right now, is this is the perfect opportunity for one Garbinia Muguruza, who finally split with Sam Sumik this year. Because if you recall, Conchita had filled in for Sam in certain spots last year. No, it was two years ago, right? Wasn't wasn't Conchita in the box with Muguruza at Wimbledon? Oh, was she? When, when, she, when she beat Venus? Venus? I don't remember. It was more of like a consultant relationship rather than a coach. She would fill in here and there. She was definitely on the bag for one of Muguruza's big showings, big wins. On the bag. On the bag. Define that, please. It's golf. It's caddying. Come on. Okay. Everybody knows do you th- this. Do you really think that would click with everybody? Are you trying to paint me as an elitist? No, no. I'm just. I was just asking because you to Because I assure you, my pronunciation of hors d'oeuvres will will disavow you of that idea <laughs> later on. You wanted to follow up on our discussion last week on WTA prize money. Yeah, I while I was editing that segment, I I left it in, but I'm not sure that the totality of my point came across and that I was possibly a little bit too harsh on the prize money and the celebration of the prize money in Shenzhen. What was it? $4.45 million that mm. Ash Barty won. And I said, well, I, I think my exact words were that it was, it felt a little bit masturbatory the way the tour was promoting it. You know, whereas I thought that perhaps that money could be best served elsewhere. Yeah. Your word choice surprised me. I just want to make clear that it is still a win. I think we said that on the podcast. Mm. But to be absolutely clear that it, it is still a win that the biggest payout in, in tennis happens at a women's event. For now, at least. The ATP Tour has is going to be upping their prize money well, at the Tour Finals in a couple of years. Yes. The bottom line is I wanted to stress that there is significant symbolic merit in the fact that that event was the biggest payout in tennis history and that it was a women's event given where women's tennis has come from you can look at this issue as i presented it in two separate ways and i think that's where my conflict is coming from because of where women's tennis came from with signing contracts for one dollar in the early 70s to struggling throughout the years for their entire existence and having to fight tooth and nail to not be the ugly stepsister of the ATP tour. That, you know, from those beginnings, I would like to see more women have access to the wealth on the WTA. But by the same token, because they've struggled so much, I get it a little bit more upon further reflection as to why this was a celebratory moment, even if it's a bit inflated, even if it's the doing of the WTA tour and not the ITF and not the the tournaments throughout the regular calendar. This is a one-off thing, but it's still good. Right. But detractors say that if WTA wants better prize money, then they have to fight for it. And here they are, signing the right contracts, getting the right sponsors, and fighting for it. But at the same so this time... Is what, this is what those people wanted, supposedly. Yeah. At the same time... Let's have that money trickle down some more as well. Right. Many things are true. Right. So we're here at your moment of the podcast. <laughs> Don't overhype it. I'm not taking pleasure in this. Hold up. You said you're not overhyping this? How many times I tell you, like, work on the agenda, work on the agenda, and you message me unprompted from work, oh, I've already added this to the agenda this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Abigail Spears, who has been partnering Nadia Kitchenock. Previously partnered Raquel Cops jones uh, now Raquel Atawo, who we talked about last episode, just retired. Spears tested positive for DHEA and testosterone and metabolites. Metabolites being like the byproducts of the chemical reactions. This is a big one. DHEA is serious. This is not 
a bespoke vitamin complex like Tomaj Bellucci. This is not a tortellini incident. <laughs> well, maybe it is. A DHEA is, is a pretty big deal. It is a naturally occurring hormone that the body produce, produces in the adrenal glands. It's an androgen. It actually is prescribed sometimes for women for unrelated things. But as an athlete, you can take it because in the body, it's converted to testosterone and obviously gives female athletes advantages in a number of ways. This is also the hormone that Bethany Maddox Sands requested a therapeutic use exemption to take two years ago and was denied because it is very clearly a violation and it's a hormone that produces testosterone in women. Which was initially approved and then denied. Is that how it went? I think that's how it went. Okay. Upon review. So Abigail Spears released a statement very soon after the ITF statement takes full responsibility, but her story is that she was diagnosed with, quote, various vitamin deficiencies. A physician recommended certain supplements, and these supplements contained DHEA. She was negligent in not reading the ingredients, and she acknowledges that, but she was insistent that she did not take the hormone purposely. Uh, to be fair, DHEA or prasterone, what it's also called, is actually available over the counter in the United States. It's available by, by prescription in a lot of other countries, but you can find it in various supplements by prescription or over the counter in the US. Is this a case of the doctor being extremely negligent in prescribing this to an athlete? She says this was a doctor who's worked with athletes, who was highly respected, and so she implicitly trusted him. I can't imagine how reckless a physician could be to prescribe something that includes prasterone or DHEA to a professional active athlete. That's all we know at the moment. I'm not going to make any uh, suggestive comments or cast aspersions. It is just a strange story and she will have to serve a ban unless she appeals and it's granted. Beatrice Haddad Maya, who tested positive in July, last we heard she had appealed and the last news I could find was from July. Haven't heard anything since then. So these are the very slow wheels of anti-doping justice, apparently. That's that. I have nothing to add on this front. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it out of your system? That's all. That's all. That's the news. Did you get the DHEA out of your system in time well, to not be detected? Well, I have DHEA by... naturally occurring, but I'm not an athlete. You could be microdosing. You could be super dosing. <laughs> you might have yeah. a match against Serena coming up. You might need to take five DHEA doses. Who knows? Four to six. Who knows? Margaret Court. Wow. I want folks to understand that this is not an issue that's going to go away. Be prepared. Brace yourselves for Australia, for the Australian Open in 2020, because it will be the 50th anniversary of Margaret Court's calendar year Grand Slam. Much like last year, it was the 50th anniversary of Rod Laver's calendar year Grand Slam. And uh, on, on the face of it, this is something that absolutely should be celebrated. Rod Laver got the red carpet. Rod Laver is the elder statesman of men's tennis right now. And so it was the perfect glove fit for Tennis Australia to parade Rod Laver every which way around the 2019 Australian Open. As to what Tennis Australia will do in 2020, that is yet to be seen. Because while Margaret Court's on-court career was exceptional, her off-court career, even then, and especially now, has been anything but. Like you said, this is coming. Margaret Court pops up every once in a while to remind you how awful she is. But th there are a lot of things happening here. Margaret Court was a great champion, and that cannot be ignored or removed from history. If this were anyone else, if this were Yvonne Gulagong, Billie Jean King, Martina Navratilova, Martina Hingis, these kind of accomplishments would need to be celebrated, right? Th this is, these are historic achievements in sport. Well, I don't know how you throw Martina Hingis in there with those folks. <laughs> That was sure that <laughs> I mean uh, I'll sub in Monica Sellis. Uh, the the point is Serena Williams, Venus Williams. The point is <laughs> Tennis Australia is in a pickle here. They've named a court after her, but we've gone through years now. Every year now there's drama 
snowballing drama with the fact that that court still bears her name. Right. Now, Margaret Court is telling us that she wants Tennis Australia to treat her like labor. She expects the same rollout that labor got last year. And wow. Well, if she wants to pivot and make this a treating woman different than man issue, that is wild. But what is interesting is that she has been vocally against women's liberation for her entire career. She did not right? give a fuck she said, about the formation of the WTA tour. She said, I never asked for equal pay way back then. She's anti-women's lib, as she calls it, in the parlance of the 60s and 70s. She was pro taking the payout to play Bobby Riggs, but she was not pro enough to beat him. Oh, Lord, she got beat really badly. But what's interesting about this is, I'll say again... If this were another great female champion, we would expect and we would advocate for her to be treated like Rod Laver, to be feted on the same level because her achievements are vast. There's no getting around that. And so, yeah, she only won 11 Grand Slams in the open era, but she won a calendar year Grand Slam in 69. She had two further years of three slams in a year. She was the best of her era. That cannot be disputed. She was better than Billie Jean. She beat Maria Bueno a bunch of times. So getting that out of the way, Tennis tennis Australia is in a pickle because she is so repellent. They have distanced themselves slowly from her because she's made herself such a liability and such a spectacle. Not distance themselves enough to the point of renaming the arena. But what also is indisputable is the fact that she is an abhorrent person. And Correct. this is not new. We... We kind of fall into this trap of thinking of Margaret Court as this caricature of a terrible person. No, in her dotage. She's this old minister who preaches against gay people, preaches against gay marriage, singles out Casey Delacqua and her family as being unnatural. But what we need to understand and properly situate here is that this is who she's always been. Margaret Court undercut women's tennis at every turn. She was only there for herself. And she also was a bigot racially. I'm not concerned at all about labeling her a bigot. Because her own words about apartheid in South Africa are hard to imagine. She said that the South Africans have the race problem sorted out. They're doing it well. Unlike the Americans. Unlike the Americans. <laughs> this was in 1970 when she said that. Um, the I think your point is that Margaret has always been awful. And, you know, I don't like saying, oh, so-and-so is a product of her times because there are so many people, uh, my grandparents, for example, who made it out of those times and uh, aren't like that. You know, like, that's not an excuse. And she was seen as awful by her peers at the time. When Martina Navratilova won Wimbledon in the early 90s, she decried the achievement as being bad because it's a, of her abhorrent lifestyle as a lesbian. It's a bad role model. Every decade, she has hit the spots. <laughs> right. She has hit the bigoted spots. And so we've been here before with Margaret. I think something that I talked about on Twitter recently is that it annoys me when I see these things reduced to someone being entitled to his or her opinions because not everyone's opinions are innocuous. You know, like opinions have real consequences in the world. Language has power. And it's not only that she believes a certain thing, but she has gone out of her way to abuse and harass queer people and queer families. She would like to make it more difficult to exist as a queer person. So her beliefs actually have material consequences in the world. And she's acted on those beliefs to try and agitate politically, specifically when Australia was going through the throes of marriage equality politically. She advocated for that not to happen. And the reasons she gave, you can imagine what they are. I'm not going to give voice to those on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So it's not that, that she has her opinions. She wants to force those opinions down our throats and to make them law. Separation of church and state is not something that Margaret Court is about. She's not about that life. She wants to have her church and have it be the state as well. I don't know how she's going to get to the Australian Open because she's boycotting just about everybody out here. 
She doesn't fly Qantas. I think she wants them to send a wagon over to Perth and take her through the outback. She can start riding those donkeys from now. I don't. Do they have donkeys there? She can get kangaroos. some. She can get some donkeys. Kangaroos. That might be a little bit is unsettling. That a, is that offensive? It may be a little bit unsettling for her health at her age to be hopping up and down. Sure. For months at a time to get to, to Melbourne. A few months ago, we spoke about the India-Pakistan Davis Cup tie, which is imminent. It was meant to happen in September. It's been postponed to November 29th. And the news here is that the ITF ruled that it must be played at a neutral site, even though Pakistan had the home tie. They cited security reasons, obviously, but double star Isam Qureshi called this decision discriminatory, was really angry about it because Pakistan has recently hosted some international top-level sporting events with no incident at all. Um, the Sri Lankan cricket team was recently hosted by Pakistan and there were no problems. Qureshi claims that the ITF initially approved the tie. And now they're coming back and saying their security advisors say, no, we can't have it in Pakistan for security reasons. So, unfortunately, Pakistan does lose their home field advantage in this case. No word on where the neutral site will be, unless there's been a further update since last Monday. In cricket, they've tended to go the route of playing these matches in the UAE. In Dubai, a lot of test matches have been held in Dubai. I can't say for sure what is what. This is beyond my expertise as far as whether conditions and security is sufficient in Pakistan to be able to host this tie. I just know that this is not something that's new. It's something that's been going on across many sports for many years at this point. The most high profile incident, which we've mentioned on the podcast when we talked about this before, in 2009, the Sri Lankan cricket team traveling in a bus to the Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore, they were shot at and multiple players were injured. Luckily, nobody died. None of the players died in that incident, but that heightened this whole situation. Right. And of and, course, this is a match between India and Pakistan, which is politically extremely charged. And so Qureshi mentions that Sri Lanka and Bangladesh have both been hosted, but India is a is a different kind of situation. Yes. that is That is the cultural context that could be missing from a lot of folks' understanding of this issue. India-Pakistan political relations are, they're fraught, and that's putting it mildly. Yeah. We'd like to reintroduce a segment we haven't done in months called Book Report. Not the most exciting title, I know. But in Book Report, we choose a player in the top 100, typically a player you may know less about and that we ourselves need to do some research about, and highlight them, talk about their background, their career, and hopefully something fun. Kudos to At The Swing Volley for requesting the return of this. I'd initially said that we probably wouldn't get to it until the new year, but hey, here we are. I'm going to start off with taking a look at Ons Jabor. She is from Tunisia. She is 25 years old, ranked number 77 in the world with a career high of number 51. One of the things that you'll probably have heard of Anj Jabor, if she's come across your radar at any point, is that she's referred to as the first Arab woman to achieve a whole bunch of things. The first that she's achieved, she is the highest ranking Arab woman in WTA history. She is the first Arab woman to make the third round of a Grand Slam. She did that two years ago for the first time at the French Open, and then again this past year, a couple months ago, at the U.S. Open, when she came back against Karolina Pliskova in the third round and almost beat her, losing 6-4 in the third. As far as her team is concerned, she's coached by Bertrand Perret, a French coach, and her fitness coach is her husband, Karim Kamoun, who is a former fencer and was working in Dubai as a fencing coach for a couple of years before eventually joining her team full-time. They got married in 2015. So she got married pretty young at 21. And not to be salacious about it, but y'all should go look him up because oh. he's worth looking at. Well, drop the IG handle. <laughs> Coming up, she spent time at the Justine Enna Academy in Belgium. There's an academy? Justine has an academy. And she also spent time at the Maratoglu Academy. I've, yeah, I've heard of that one. 
On the junior circuit, she made the 2010 French Open final, losing to Elena Svitolina, before making the final again in 2011, this time beating Monica Puig. Her best WTA result is the 2018 Kremlin Cup final. In that tournament, she beat Sloane Stevens and at Kantavite, Sevastova, before losing eventually to Kazatkina in the final in three sets. She's made 15 ITF finals with her record 11-4. and four. And while she's currently the only Arab woman ranked inside the top 300 or so on the WTA Tour, she is joined by Malik Jaziri on the men's side as the two beacons of Arab tennis at this point. Malik Jaziri is also from Tunisia. I will say, though, that these two players and Anz Jabor come from a, a bigger pool of Arab tennis players than you would expect. The lineage, particularly at the turn of the millennium, was was pretty good. I remember growing up watching tennis in the 90s and knowing players like Karim Alami, Hisham Arasi, and Yunus Alanawi. Granted, those were all male players, but at that time, it seemed that tennis in the North African and Middle Eastern parts of the world was set to experience a boon, and that didn't really happen. On the women's side, the record that, that Anz Jabor beat in terms of being the, the first woman to achieve a certain ranking was that of Salima Sfar. In 2001, Salima reached a career high of number 75, and they've since worked together, and she's become somewhat of a mentor for her. But there hasn't really been a, a lot of women from this part of the world to play professional tennis. And so whenever Anz Jabor takes the court, this is a pressure that she has. Right? It's, it's totally different from, say, Danielle Collins playing tennis in her mid-twenties. You know, she doesn't have the added pressure of being the beacon of tennis hope for everybody in America. Because America has a huge history, a founding history almost, of, of tennis stars. To date, Anz Jabor has had three top ten wins. In 2017, she beat Dominika Sibolkova in the first round of the French Open. At that time, Sibolkova was ranked number seven, and that was when Anz Jabor made the third round of a slam for the first time. So that was a big breakout moment for her. In 2018, she beat Simona Halep, I believe in Beijing, in the first round. Halep at the time was ranked number one. Halep lost the first set and then eventually retired in that match. She was not at her most fit at her fighting best. And then in 2018, I referenced her best WTA result, making the final of the Kremlin Cup. At that tournament, she beat the number eight ranked Sloane Stephens. This year, she's beat Donna Vekic twice. Really? Yes. She beat Joe Kanto this year as well, on grass. She's had spurts of promising results. Something that's always been a bit of a bugaboo for her is fitness. And provided that's something that she can improve, Anz Jabor is somebody that you could look for big things, I think, in the future. She has an unconventional game. She's able to slice and dice, hit with power. She can do a lot of things on the tennis court. I just want to drop in there to finish off your wonderful segment. If you are looking for news about North African Middle Eastern tennis, Reem Abalil is the person to look for on Twitter. She's really one of the leading journalists coming out of that part of the world in both English and Arabic, and has covered Jabour and Jaziri extensively. Yes, and as you might imagine, her work were primary sources for the segment. Yes. Okay, my book report, totally different. I'm looking at current world number 48, John Millman, career high number 33, probably best known for beating Roger Federer at the 2018 US Open and then reaching the quarterfinals that year. By far his, his best result, the best week of his career. John is Australian. He's widely known as one of, really one of the most well-liked, one of the nicest guys on tour, and one of the fittest guys on tour. Case in point, he was nominated for ATP Comeback Player of the Year in 2018, and he publicly lobbied the ATP to give the award to somebody else, to his countryman Jason Kubler, who was undergoing uh, a series of knee surgeries, unranked in 2017, and then cracked the top 100 in 2018. 
So John sort of took himself out of the competition and lobbied for his countrymen to win the award. Novak Djokovic actually won that year. Millman himself has been through a lot of injury breaks, a lot of brushes with retirement earlier in his career. He had shoulder surgery in 2013, and during the layoff, he worked at a mortgage brokery in Brisbane. Needed something to do, probably needed some extra cash while he was not playing. Came back, reached the top 100 in 2015, then missed the first four months of 2017 with a torn tendon in his groin. And 2018 was really the breakout year of his career with the Roger Federer victory, uh, his first career final in Budapest. And, you know, if you've been following John over the past few years, he's suffered a bit of a slump after that U.S. Open. His 2019 was not the greatest, but he did reach another final in October, lost to Novak Djokovic. His, uh, his ranking fell all the way to 95 after those U.S. Open points came off in September, but he's back to 48, and now he's a two-time runner-up on the ATP level, has never won a title, but he has won 12 challengers, and I think five more future-level events. So his record on that level is crazy good. If you follow him on Twitter, if you don't, you should, because it is a treasure trove of, I mean, uh, good feelings, a lot of jokes, some opinionated posts about Davis Cup and the ATP Cup. He is continually bigging up his countrymen and countrywomen, especially Ashley Barty. Ash Barty shows up constantly on his feed. He's always celebrating her achievements, was celebrating the Fed Cup final. He has this... Uh, running segment, I would say, about the fox, which is what his father calls himself. So he'll tell stories in the notes app about his father getting lost, going to get towels at a tournament, getting off the plane at Heathrow, refusing to follow any instructions, and showing up at some random pub in a different borough. Anyway, Millman's Twitter is a hoot. He's uh, well known for fan interactions. He's always turning to his fans and thanking them after matches. Often he takes drinks out of the cooler and hands them out. You hear a lot of stories about fans saying, oh, John came up to me after the match and shook my hand, thanked me for my support. Like he, this guy is beloved, especially in his hometown of Brisbane, that hashtag Millmania came about a few years ago in Brisbane. He wrote something in the athlete's voice that I'd like you to close this segment with. Yeah, a quote that really stuck out to me. He said, not being the most talented guy out there makes me even more proud of where I've got to. But I've had to rely on other talents. I've had to rely on being strong mentally, on being a tough competitor. Tennis isn't all about being talented in terms of how you strike the ball, or whether you can serve 220 kilometers an hour. Trust me, I'd love to have that. But there's a lot of other little skills and attributes that define talent also. Okay. Hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about Anz Jabor and John Millman. We did promise that we'd circle back, we'd reach around to your hideous mispronunciation of the word hors d'oeuvre. You're used, not only are you putting me on the spot, but you're also mocking me for the reach around thing again. Yes. Like this is untenable, unacceptable. Listen, you use reach around tongue firmly in cheek. I was in college. I was fresh out of Jamaica, like less than a year in college. And we didn't really, I mean, yes, we had appetizers, but we didn't call them appetizers in Jamaica. You're just eating finger food or something, you know? And so I'm at this private college in the U.S. and with my friends, Jamaican friends, and I'd heard the word hors d'oeuvres before, but I'd never seen it. And I'd certainly never pronounced it. And I, if I had heard it, I didn't make the connection as to what it was. And so... I'm reading this menu for this event where there's going to be free food. You know, that's what you do when you're a freshman and you're poor and you don't got no money and you're running out of <laughs> meals on your meal plan. <laughs> you know, you look for the places where you can get free food on campus. So we're all looking at this menu and I read out aloud and I say, whores divorce. And as soon as I said it, I knew exactly what I had done, and I knew exactly what it meant, but that horse had already left the gate. And if you know anything about Jamaican people, you know that they live to laugh at your mistakes. They live to laugh at when you fall down, when <laughs> you 
experience any kind of misfortune that's not life-threatening. I mean, if it's really serious, you'll get the empathy. But when it's something that shocking, like, you're going to get it. And in that moment, I just had to accept it. I, If I had been in that position of witnessing it happen, I would not have let that go. So I kind of <laughs> enjoyed it along with them. It was and is something that still gives me actual enjoyment to this day because it was so outrageously bad for a learned educated person it was just a confluence of 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 events that allowed me to do that mm -hmm. you know i have also been on the receiving end of jamaican schadenfreude will i say and i don't ever want to be there again the the roasting is thorough and it is vociferous you know, people are out here rolling on the floor <laughs> laughing, literally. I believe white people saw Jamaican people rolling on the floor laughing, and that's how it started. Oh, the... the uh, ROFL. That's how it started. <laughs> and I... We would have ROFL breaks where we would just all just be rolling on the floor laughing for about five minutes and then get back to life. Mm. In solidarity with your massive fuck-up, who am I to judge? I'm drinking red wine with an ice cube in it. Oh, you feel bad. Is that you what this is? You don't want to comment? <laughs> no, because I see you. You're transparent. You are trying to make things a little bit better for the fucker that you've perpetrated against me on this episode by taking a dig at yourself. I oh. see you. I see your transparency. Always looking I at... will not engage with it. Always assuming the absolute worst. And it's, it's also a something that I've already put out in public that you put an ice cube in your red wine. So this is not new. Tell the people something new that's really fucked up about yourself and then we can get try to get back on even footing. wow you know it's it's actually just really sad that that's how you view the world so we're gonna move on christmas is coming up and you might want to think about the letter that you'll be writing to santa because sarah irani certainly has opinions on that <laughs> you may have seen sarah irani out here serving underhand at a challenger recently as you know, her serve has been a mess. She served like double digit, double faults a bunch of times. And honestly, I feel for her. Clearly something is going on. It's not just double digits. It's like approaching triple digits. It's, no, it's, it's not. really bad. That's an exaggeration. No, it's like, it's historically bad. It It is fairly shocking. However, she just played a tournament in Paraguay. She reached the final. It was a great week for her. And she served underhand the entire week. Be and it's effective. It's not like a little puffball underhand. She she does try to do something with it, if you've seen the video. Mm -hmm. Point is, Sarah had had enough. And if you if you haven't detected yet, this is a dramatic reading. You We are about to give you a dramatic reading. Because Sarah took to social media and, and let us know her thoughts. How do you want to do this? Do you want me to read it in English and then you read it in Italian? <laughs> well, I'm not going to... So... Italian is much, much more wordy than English, so it's a lot longer. I'm not going to read the whole thing in Italian. Just a, a few, a few parts. Mm -hmm. She says, Ciao ragazzi, volevo condividere con voi un pensiero, which means I want to share with you a thought. Now get ready. I've just finished my tournament in Asuncion, Paraguay, where I lost in the final. It has been a quite pleasant week on personal side and a quite tough one tennis-wise. As you know, since when I started again playing tennis in February, after the Tordellini incident... That was a parenthetical addition. I don't know what you're talking about. I had a lot of problems with my serve, and here in Paraguay, I decided with my team to serve underarm all week long. I realize now that during this week, I received not a single critic or complaint from people here, and I've been encouraged and applauded for my resilience and for my desire to find a solution. Even on social network, where it is always easier, no one from Paraguay sent me anything bad, only positive messages. So all y'all from all other countries in the world, y'all ain't shit. <laughs> Instead, in Italy, I keep being insulted by a lot of people regarding mainly my serve. I think I definitely thought too much in the last few years about your comments, insults, and opinions, and now I cannot anymore. If I'm not able to serve again like normal players do, maybe I will just serve underarm. If I'm not able to even serve underarm, I'll think about something else. If it's not okay with you, 
send a letter to the WTA asking to change the rules about serve or ask them to disqualify me for quote-unquote awful serve if instead you just have other problems with me? Send a letter to Santa. Bye! Se invece avete altri problemi o richieste particolari mandate pure una letterina a Babbo Natale. Ciao ciao! Send a letter to Santa. <laughs> if you got a problem with my underarm serve, take it up with the WTA, let them ban it. Otherwise, shut the fuck up or if you must get it out, write a letter to Santa. This is so good. It is so entertaining because the Italian is very heightened. It is very formal. You can tell she's serious the way she's written it. It's not written in social media speak. She's done with it. She's going to serve underarm. If she can't do that anymore, she's going to, I don't know, she's going to throw it over the net or something. But she's still out here. That's the best thing that Sarah Rani has ever done in her career. <laughs> a really? A, for us. For a, us. <laughs> a former runner-up at Rolling Girls. She's that's taken the best thing. steps to fuck up our lives <laughs> in the past with her results mm -hmm. on court. But this is something that we wholeheartedly embrace. So thank mm -hmm. you, Ms. Arani. She said, if you don't like it, go tell your mama. Go send una letterina a Babbo Natale. Her name is Sarah, Miss Tortellini, if you're nasty. <laughs> On that very petty note, thank you for listening to The Body Serve. My name is Jonathan. You can at, find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. We're going to be wrapping up the season very shortly. We're in this stretch of releasing episodes every Monday or Tuesday now until we decide that our fifth season is over. And in the next couple of weeks, we will be launching that GoFundMe that we've teased in the last two episodes. So, unashamedly, get your coins ready. All right, you can find us on Twitter at Beyonce. At, um, sorry, at The Body Surf. Oh my God. And Instagram. We're on Spotify now, iTunes, all that. Thanks for listening, and uh, we will probably see you next week. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.